Hey, take your copy of God's Word, and I want you to make your way, if you would, over to 1 Samuel. Now, as I call out the text, let me just simply uh, say to us, uh, when you get to 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, the immediate, for those of us who have been students and followers of Jesus for any length of time, you're going to recognize this passage. And as we've often said, when you get to a passage that is this familiar, the, familiar, the familiarity of it will breed a little bit of complacency. Because we, you know, whether it was children with Kool-Aid, crayons, or whether we've heard it unpacked by some of the greatest teachers and preachers, when you get to the story of David and Goliath, because of the exposure, sometimes it lessens the expectancy from the text. But you're holding in your hand a book that's unlike any other book, beloved. This is a supernatural document. And it's never, ever the same when you go to it because it doesn't depend on the handwriting of a man, but the inspiration of the Holy Ghost of God. Yeah. So when you get to this place, it's one of those places that you, you've got to prepare your heart not to presume on the text. Now, we're in a series called Wired for Worship. Uh, this faith family called Fairview is about to go through, uh, in about 14 days, uh, two weeks from this Sunday, we're going to go through a significant transition. We are going to celebrate the closing of a season that started five years ago. I asked uh, Brother Mike to come for 30 days five years ago. <laughs> and he and his family graciously have uh, stayed the course and walked in the Spirit. And we are not the same because this great man of God and his family came our way. And uh, to be candid with you, we are spoiled. There are churches quite literally all over America. In fact, most of us really have no estimation of what God did when he sent Brother Mike and his family to us. We were hurting, wounded. We were a little bit skeptical. And uh, over the past five years, God's not only healed, but he's excelled in anything we could have hoped or imagined. Now, here's the point. Not only are we celebrating Brother Mike uh, on April the 7th, but we are introducing our new worship leader. And be candid with you. It's hard for us and our humanity sometimes to make room in our hearts for new folks because we can't let go of the other folks. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at some biblical principles to help us navigate a little bit of that in our own worship. When you get to this passage, because we expect to know where it's headed, it, sometimes we check out. We can physically be in the room but not spiritually present to hear what the Father says. I recently heard about a young lady that had a uh, tragic, uh, unexpected, near-death experience. In fact, on the operating table, something uh, significant happened. Her heart stopped, and she saw the bright light. She felt the warmth, and she began to walk into it, and she said, oh, God, is, is this death? Am I coming home? And she heard a booming voice from heaven that said, no, it's not your time. In fact, you've got 50 more years. This is just a moment. You're going back, and you're going to live out 50 glorious years. Sure enough, they shocked her back. She woke up and she was so elated, so excited that she recalled the booming voice of the Heavenly Father saying, you've got 50 years. She said, Doc, I'm going to stay in the hospital. I, I want to get some things nipped and tucked and poked and prodded and pulled out, sucked out, pushed up, got her hair changed and total complete makeover, left the hospital after healing up and stepped out on a curb and tragically, accidentally, unforeseen, an ambulance plowed her down. She stepped into heaven and said, Father, you told me I had 50 more years. He said, well, I didn't recognize you. <clears throat> Will you take your copy of God's word and I pray you recognize this text. Let's set the tenor and the tone just a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, let's go to verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. And uh, because uh, we're packed in and if you move, somebody's going to steal your seat. Just stay where you are. Look at verse 1 with me. If you're ready for the reading of God's word, say amen. amen. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Azekah uh, in a hard word. Verse 2. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah. And they drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath, from Gath, 
whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Keep your Bible open. You're going to need it as we continue to walk through this text. Now, uh, what we're going to do this morning in very simple terms, I'm going to give you just a few words to hang your thoughts and your heart on so that you expand this in your own private praise and prayer time. I want to show you first and foremost the the situation. Now, oftentimes what we do is we alienate, we isolate a text like this, and we're we're riveted by by the moment that we, little ruddy David, little red-headed, blue-eyed, freckle-faced, an anomaly of a Hebrew boy, uh, steps out on the battlefield, and uh, it's a battle by proxy is what it is. And we get get caught up in it, and we rightly, we should. But what you need to understand is the situation that leads up to this. Uh, The Hebrews are not just any people. They are a miraculous people. In fact, they came from a set of senior adults who didn't have any people. They they came from uh, some folks that were already in the AARP who had more sons and daughters than the sands on the seashore and the stars in the skies. They have been subjugated for 400 plus years in a picture of the world, Egypt. It's, it's imposing. It's overlording. They have lived under the, the, the snap of, of, of the slave taskmaster's whip. They, it's a picture of sin. But with a mighty hand, God brings them out across the Red Sea. And what I love about this story that I cannot just simply ignore is not only did God bring them out with a mighty hand, but he left the bloated bodies of those who had tortured him, them on the shore of yesterday. Whatever haunts you today, I'm telling you in the authority of God's word, not only will he seal the deal at Calvary that brings you to heaven, he will also defeat the enemy that's harassing you right here on earth. Filled their pockets full of gold and led them out with a strong hand. And they got into the land called the promised land. And I'm going to pause just to say it this way because it perplexed me. And perhaps there's somebody in this room struggling with this same biblical fact. When I got saved, I... You know my story, I I couldn't read very well, and and, um, I would listen to the Bible on tape, and I would listen to the Old Testament, and it struck me odd. Why would a loving God who sent his only begotten son to come get the wretches like me tell his people, the Hebrews, now when you get into the land, I'm going to give you land you didn't buy it, and we'll give you houses you didn't build, vineyards you didn't plant, wells you didn't dig. When you get there, there are seven distinct ethnic cities, people that have to be destroyed. Well, that doesn't match up with a loving father who would send the rose of Sharon. How do you, how do you reconcile that in, in, in this, this ogre of a God, this, this, this ominous sign that to destroy? I mean, when you get to those cities, I mean, nothing lives. The dog's got to die. The cat's got to die. Everything's got to go. Well, how do you reconcile that? Well, American theology doesn't cotton to the supernatural, so I'll just simply say it this way. In a moment, you and I, when we talk about not only the situation nationally, but the location immediately, you're going to discover that there were seven cities that were infiltrated with a demonic bloodline. Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God, those are angels who rallied with Lucifer, who once carried the very glory of God. Ezekiel chapter 28, Isaiah chapter 14, he had built into him as a supernatural creation. He would bring the visible glory called the Shekinah glory of God into creation and the angels would rejoice. And seven times, seven times, Lucifer said in his heart, I want the glory, I want the glory, I want the glory. I want to sit upon the mount. What mount? The very place you see today on CNN or Fox News or whatever you watch, that gold dome building that sits on the temple mount. That's the foundation stone. And Lucifer said, I don't want anybody else to be worshiped. I'm the one bringing all the glory. He would open his mouth with musical stunning ability. One third of the angels rallied to his rebellion. That's why it's important that we pause for just a moment. Rehearse a truth that's not an indictment on us, but it bears repeating because To be candid with you, beloved, a lot of pastors don't want you to peek behind the curtain. We don't want you to see that we're human and we're frail and we have feet of clay and we mess up. And your staff does not come to work every Monday through Friday and sit in this room and chant scripture. (laughs) It's not what we do. I told you that worship leaders hold oftentimes the emotional capital of the church. Think about it. 
They, they move us. They can shift the room. They, they, they don't have to rebuke. They don't have to correct. They don't have to instruct in all righteousness. They've never had to go to the helm and tell you, you need to start tithing. <laughs> right? Yeah. They, they don't have to confront you with doctrinal error for the most part. Therefore, we love them. They sing our favorite songs. They stand with us beside the graveside. They sing those songs that warm our hearts and remind us that mama's not gone. She's in heaven. Dad didn't depart to death. He's simply gone into the audience of the Almighty, and they can split a church in a skinny minute. Part of that is because uh, behind the scenes, music is so powerful. When you get to this particular passage, you're dealing with a nation that is uh, fighting a lot of what we fight as Americans. They're brought out as a unique people. And I'm going to give you just two things just for your own, uh, your own sanctification. There's two things that sets this, this nation called the Hebrews, the Israelis apart. They go into this land and they worship different than anybody else. They don't worship what they created with their hands. They don't bark at the trees and run up the mountains and, and have sexual intercourse to get Baal stirred up so he can fertilize Mother Earth's egg. And that's the PG version of it. They worship one true and living God. And everywhere they go, in just a moment, you're going to see it. They are, they are in the presence of God. Can you imagine the Lord said, build me a tabernacle that I might dwell among them. Does that not overwhelm you this morning? That God condescended and said, listen, in the midst of their frailty and humanity and their rebellion and their wickedness, I want to be with them and sin said, you can't because sin separates us. So the father said, that's fine. I've got a son who's going to die to bring you home. Their worship set them apart. But here's one that we don't often think about. Not only their worship, but their work. Now, don't you think about this? In a, in a, in a nation where we're, you know, we're buying as much as we can get and getting all we can and can what we got and sit on the can and let the rest spoil. He said, now, you're going you're gonna to work six days a week, but on the seventh, Saturday, Sabbath, you're going to rest. Now, I want you to imagine now, this probably happened. You know, the Hebrews were prolific shepherds, and the land just busted forth with milk and honey, and everywhere they went, the presence of God went. Wherever God goes, it's good. Amen. Say amen. amen. So one day, perhaps, a Pezzarite walked up and said, listen, we've noticed something about you Hebrews. You are peculiar people. You vanquish the greatest military power ever to exist in contemporary times. You come over here, and everywhere you go, there's a pillar of fire that leads you by night that serves as a nightlight. <laughs> and there's a cloud by day, and you never have to put on SPF anything because he just keeps you from standing in the sun. And we've heard your worship. It's incredible. <laughs> Uh, we'd like to buy some sheep from you. And, 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 and the Hebrew guy says, well, that'd be great. Um, tell you what we could do. Um, I could meet you um, on Monday. And the Pezzarite says, no, 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 no. So we, we can't, we, by the time we travel and we buy all your sheep, which we'd like to buy all your sheep because we're going to have mutton. But what we don't have for mutton, we want to get the wool. We want to buy them all. This is a multi-million dollar deal. Uh, we'd like to buy it on, oh, let's see, Saturday. And the Hebrew says, oh, oh we don't do business on Saturday. That's the Sabbath. And the Pezzarite says, now, wait a minute. I'm talking about a multi-million dollar contract. And they said, well, we don't care. Because, see, we don't, we don't believe our provision comes from the sheep. We believe it comes from the great shepherd. We don't believe that we're going to be fed from the hand of a business deal. We believe our father will never forsake, never forsake a seed, nor his righteous will ever be, ever, ever be seed begging bread. And we just want you to know, we don't work on Saturday. What do you do? We worship God. You are some strange people. So situationally, if, you, if, you, if you're still with me, when you step into this text, they not only have they begun to move away from their worship and they've made work their God, they said, we don't want to be different. We don't want to look different. We, what we want is we want to have a king. I'm going to just make this parenthetically. This is not pointed to anybody in the room, but I made a note in my private praise and prayer time that, uh, you know, predominantly the problem in this text are tall people. <laughs> y'all get that? I, I'm not making it up. I mean, it's Saul. He's head and shoulders above everybody else. Goliath. I mean, I have to tell you about him. It's the wee little boys that get it going on with God. Amen? <laughs> it's, just, it's just an ancillary observation. See, this is what happens, beloved. When, when, when we decide we don't want to be different, 
When we decide that we don't want to be peculiar, we lose our salt. And what happens is very quickly in this message, I just need you to take this away. When you refuse to be the generation God's called you to be, you curse the next generation to live in your disobedience and fruit. How could a nation arise that didn't know God? Who failed to tell them that they came out with a strong hand of the Lord with their pockets filled with gold in the presence of the loving one who sheltered them and shone his glory about who did this? Not Who wants a king? We've got the king of kings. But this is what they said. We, we don't want to be different. We, we want to be like everybody else. We want to be cookie cutter. We don't want any distinction among the nations. Listen to me. You are a child of the most high God. This world is not your home. Don't you panic. Don't you frantic. Don't you freak out. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what happens in Washington. God is sitting high, looking low. He's not sick. He's never one time had dementia. He is a mighty God and he's got an answer. And there is a day coming when all of this nonsense is going to end. And besides that, some of you need to embrace your peculiarity. <laughs> Amen? Who wants to be like everybody else? We're not like everybody else. We're children of a king. So the situation is that they, they have, they, they've begun to worry a little bit, and they, they're, trying to, they're trying to water it down and amalgamate. And then by the time you get from chapter 8, they want a king like the other nations. They want to operate. Then you get to chapter 15, and Saul makes a desperate attempt to operate in his prowess instead of the power of the Holy Spirit, and he doesn't kill the Amalekites like he's told. Now, I, I don't have time, but I'm going to challenge you. Now, I'm confident in saying this, and I, I, don't, I, I don't mind being pushed back. I'm just telling you, I, I've settled this in my spirit. If you want to know who lives in the Gaza today, if you want to know why these people are demonically motivated to pillage, rape, and put infants in ovens in the kibbutz on October the 7th, you track them down, they are the descendants of the Amalekites. They're not even supposed to be in existence. They're supposed to be annihilated. See, when God steps into your life, it's not that he doesn't love other people or other things, but he so loved you that he does not want an enemy that's infiltrated with the bloodline of Satan. Hold that thought because I know you're going to push back and say, I've never heard that in my life. Well, in just a moment, you're going to hear it again. And I'm going to show you biblically why it's imperative to understand this battle by proxy with David. Now, that's the situation. Sweetheart, would you bring me that? Oh, you got Miss Corey. Can I have that water? Y'all pray this, um, this whatever we got a hold of, Christy and I, it is relentless. And it will, um, we're going to have to go to filters when we smoke. <laughs> <clears throat> Them lucky strikes. Lucky strikes are killing us, baby. <clears throat> now, get back up here. Now, that's the situation. Do you, do you understand that? Now, I want you to notice the location very quickly because I'm, I'm running out of time very fast. Now, watch this. God never puts anything incidental, accidental in the text. Now, the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and uh, Azekah. Now, God doesn't put this stuff in there just to bore us out of our brains. Everything in this book is divinely gloriously inspired. Say amen. amen. Let me show you what I mean by this. So for example, when they came out, God said, I'm going to dwell among you. I'm sending you into a land of darkness. Now you're going to have to deal with the seven cities that are demonically infiltrated. How, how does a man the size of Goliath show up in his size? He has six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot. How is this man? What is he? He's a demonic infiltration because there was a promise in Genesis chapter 3, that through the bloodline of, of a woman, that Messiah was coming. Well, immediately Lucifer said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to infiltrate that bloodline demonically because if I can keep Messiah from being born of a woman, he, then God can't redeem what I've stolen in, in the rebellion. Say amen. amen. So when he brings them out, he's not just bringing them out to, to, to extinguish all, you know, the whole people. He's bringing them to witness and evangelize the rest of the land. So this is what, you know, an artist would, would say it looked like perhaps. Uh, you notice of the nighttime, they've got, they've got God's big old street light. They're camped out all around. This is a place of worship. Do you remember that song we just sang, Incense Arise, 
Listen, that, that, that's not just a cute, pithy phrase. That's a biblical truth because inside of this tabernacle, there's only one way in, the eastern gate. You can't go in any other way. So when Jesus said, no man coming to the Father except through me, there's one way. Every Hebrew knew, oh, oh, he's talking about the tabernacle. There's not but one way. And you, when you come in, you've got to go by the altar. You've got to die yeah. before you can get to the glory. When you got into the inside of this, there was a, there's an, an altar of incense, and it was a beautiful uh, fragrance. In fact, nobody could reproduce it under the penalty of death. It was a revelation by the Holy Ghost of God. They would pour those incense over on those hot coals, and it would rise up to the glory of God and fill his arena with sweet, savory smells, which were the prayers of the people, so much so that by the time they built the, the temple in Jerusalem, it is said in Jerusalem that no woman wore, wore perfume in the city of Jerusalem because the city was perfumed by the prayers of the people of God. Can you imagine? Now listen, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to receive this, but can you imagine walking through the city of Knoxville and God being so real because churches stopped fighting for numbers and butts in a seat and they started fighting the good fight of faith and they weren't worried about who was the biggest and the richest, but who was getting a hold of the horns of the altar? Can you imagine walking through the hurting parts of our city and it being so filled with the prayer of the saints of God that men and women were absolutely struck by the awesomeness in Knoxville, Tennessee and they would stop. Y'all ain't even receiving what I'm saying. Y'all ain't even receiving what I'm saying. Can you imagine? In fact, I've got historical evidence. When Charles Wesley would preach in the city of Savannah, the Holy Ghost of God so fell across that city, they couldn't run him out. They couldn't kill him. They, they loosed bulls on him. He was preaching on a, on a sawed off stump and a deacon got mad at him. Imagine that. And loosed a bull on him. He stepped outside the city limits so they couldn't harass him. And the power of God so fell on the city of Savannah, Georgia, that it it is said that they had Wesley's disease because God's power so fell that men and women were under conviction, found alongside the road, calling out on the name of Jesus Christ to be saved. Now, I know what your bag of bones is saying. Preacher, that can't happen here. Not as long as you're saying that, Goober, it probably won't. But the same God that did it in Savannah is the same God that can do it today in Knoxville, Tennessee. That whole place was filled with his presence and the perfume of their prayers. Now, you know the situation. I want you to notice the location. It, it, it says that they were in the valley of Elah. It's about 22, 23 miles south of Jerusalem. In the tribe of Judah. I want you to notice something here. Some of you have seen this before, but just bear with me. When they bivouacked, when they camped under Levitical instruction, the Bible told them where to camp. There's 12 tribes. For example... This is the eastern side that you would come in to worship and offer your sacrifice of praise and prayer. This, this is the tribe of Reuben over here to the, um, to the south. This is the tribe of Judah, which is stationed outside the eastern gate. Now answer me a question. Who comes from the tribe of Judah by the name of the lion of the tribe of Judah? Jesus Christ. Listen very carefully to me, very quickly. I promise you on the authority of God's holy word, he's got you exactly where he wants you. Yeah. And when you woke up this morning, when you got up and you, decided, you, you, you were following the leadership of the Holy Ghost of God, and you're part of the tribe of Gad, and you're saying, well, I'm way back here in the middle of nowhere. I'm back off up here. I ain't even close to the Eastern Gate. I promise you God's got a plan for Gad, just like he does Benjamin, just like he does the tribe of Judah. And I know some of you are thinking, well, I don't have a platform. I don't have a voice. I don't have an audience. Let me tell you, you got an audience of one, and he's put you exactly where you're supposed to be. And do you know that without the tribe of Gad, do you understand they are the leading so far. They are the leading sounding war. They are the ones who are some of the most skilled of picking up the shofar, the ram's horn, and being able to signal with just a twinge, just a, just a tweaking bit of the sound. They were able to rally the whole nation. I'm telling you, God's got you exactly where you're at. Don't you ever doubt him. But hear me, what in the world are the Philistines doing and the Amalekites doing in the tribe of Judah's land? That's not their land anymore. <laughs> what in the world? Listen to me. There are some of us that cannot get in the audience of the Almighty. We cannot get to the place we need to go the most because 
We have never exercised the holy confidence that what God bought through his son at the cross of Calvary is sealed and done and you don't have to live under the tyranny of the enemy anymore. Do you understand what a sad word this is? That they came to the tribe of Judah. This is the very lineage. This is the very place that they're going to come with the, with, with the Messiah. Why are the Philistines and the Amalekites have any authority? Because, because instead of exercising the authority they had, they succumbed to the moment and they decided to live with the agony of the enemy instead of the glory of God. Don't do it, beloved. Now, I'm going to show you practically how that, kind of how that plays out a little bit. Um, in the midst of this, and we'll, we'll get rid of that. Now, you got the situation, you got the location. Now, now watch the oppression. I'm going to give you three areas of oppression that we are typically, um, we have to deal with when it comes to worship. Chapter 17, I want you to look, if you would, very quickly at verse 5. By the way, the word soko, they were encamped at soko. The word literally means entangled. Entangled. Let me give you an example. You come into worship, but the problem that you're supposed to leave in the parking lot so you could get in the presence with the one who has the answer, you can't be a part of what God just did in the worship because you're so fixated on the problem, you can't get to the one who's got the answer. And, and you're present physically, but you can't spiritually tune in. God's got a word in worship. He's got a word in the word. He's got a word through other believers. But because you're so fixated and, and that harassing Amalekite, that harassing Philistine, who the truth of the matter is, ought to be dead anyway. Yeah. That sucker ought to be dead anyway. Watch what happens emotionally. There are, I'm going to give you these three for the sake of time when it comes to oppression. There are three leading enemies that we deal with when it comes to worship that oppress us spiritually, emotionally, and personally. Now, I want you to look at verse 5 of chapter 17, and we're going to talk about what oppresses us spiritually, which is also oftentimes physically. He had, speaking of uh, Goliath, he had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail. Now, uh, I've been blessed to have some friends in Israel, some teaching rabbis, and I'd heard this, but I didn't trust it. So I reached out a few weeks ago to uh, one of the teaching rabbis and I asked him, is this a true translation? Because while we in America translate a coat of mail, it literally, in fact, in some of your Bibles, it will say at the bottom, that what he had on, which weighed a total of 480 pounds. It is not a coat of mail like we think of in medieval terms. It is a coat or clothing of scales. Let's pause there a minute. Somebody help me out. It seemed like there was something else with scales that showed up in the garden that stepped in and divided us through rebellion. See, this dude, this is not just a physical war. This dude has on a coat of scales because he's representing, he's representing the evil one. And what will happen is physically, spiritually, oftentimes we can't get to the place we need to get in worshiping God because we've let the enemy intimidate us to the point that we can no longer physically, uh, uh, spiritually hear the voice of the Father. Hey, hey, listen to this lying nine, you know, nine to 10 foot lying, clothed in scales. Listen to what he's saying. Who are you to come at me, you dog? That, that's a unbelievable, I, I mean, that's as vile as you can get. Do you know that the enemy, there's times when, when the Holy Spirit of God will sit down in this room, I've met him a hundred times. I've, I, I'm telling you, they don't even know. They don't even know. I'm about to give myself away. We'll be in a room like this. I mean, the Holy Ghost of God will sit down. He'll come in like a fog. Oil will drip in the spiritual realm. You can sense people getting with the Father. And, and I'll walk out this door, walk out that door between services, and, and I'll be behind some goober gump, mule-faced, bucket-headed, stiff-necked religious relic that I don't still know how they're even here. And they'll say something like this, I want to get nothing out of that service. Well, Stevie Wonder could have seen that God was in the room for the love of all that's holy. How could you miss it, Goober? I'll tell you how. Because you were so physically worried about who Tennessee's going to play next. You so, you so tore up politically, you can't get in tune spiritually. You, you so messed up because, because you're trying to figure out how to, how to fix something in the physical, you miss God doing something in the supernatural. Don't let this uncircumcised, scaly dude intimidate you. You look him square in the face. Now, I know, I know it's intimidating. I know how you tall people are. 
You remember what Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary. You don't have to live in that. You got demonic activity, demonic oppression. You got some stronghold in your life. I'm telling you on the authority of God's word and in the name that's above every other name, God is able to absolutely vanquish your enemy today. And you don't have to live under the tyranny of that anymore. Not physically, not spiritually. Now, here's the second one very quickly. I'm almost out of time. Not only is, is there a spiritual oppression, there's an emotional oppression. And I don't know, beloved, this, this may not sometimes be the worst of them. Look at verse 28. For the sake of time, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard that David had come in and that he'd spoken to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Now, okay, number one, David didn't come down to see the battle. He was under, he was doing what his dad told him to do. That's all he was doing. Do you know sometimes you can get in trouble? doing the right thing? Y'all say amen. amen. Now listen, you can't do the right thing the wrong way and God bless it. But you can do the right thing and, and the enemy try to pervert it. You can. So here's old Eliab. Now if you read the Bible, he's one of them tall boys. Go back and look at it. And, and, and the preacher comes by to anoint the next king and Eliab thought it was him because he's good looking, got that Joel Osteen hair. He's standing there just waiting for the oil to be poured over his head. And, and the Holy Ghost said, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. You judge by the outward appearance. I judge by the inward appearance. That, that's not the one. In fact, you, you're looking for the one that wasn't even there yeah. because Hebrew theology teaches us that he was a ruddy, redheaded, which less than one-tenth of one percent of all Jewish children ever born are redheaded, blue-eyed, which is even less than one-tenth of one percent, and he, he had fair complexion. And because the Hebrews, his daddy was ashamed of him and didn't even call him to the revival meeting. I want you to hear this. I, this is not original with me, but it's worth hearing. If you don't let God heal you, you will bleed on people that didn't cut you. And there, listen, there's some well-meaning people that will say, I tell you, I tried that church and y'all, them hand-raising, shouting, I tell you, that makes me nervous. What are you going to do when you get to heaven, goober? <laughs> For the love of you long face, y'all could suck marbles out of a gopher hole. What do you think you're going to do when you get to glory? And I just want to say this in passing preventatively. We've had people say, I don't like his humor in the pulpit. They laugh too much. Well, we got saved, not, not embalmed. <laughs> Amen. Hey, joke's on you, dude. We're going to heaven. <laughs> and we're going to enjoy our way there. And sometimes we're laughing at you. <laughs> Just too much frivolity in that church. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. They'll walk up every time emotional. This is what they'll do to you. They'll intimidate. They'll, say th they'll speak over you things. They, his heart wasn't full of, of, of you know, being disrespectful. He was just doing what the Father told him to do. Let me just say something to some of y'all. We're going to keep it biblical, and it's always going to be done decently in order in this house, but let me explain something to you. The, 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 some of you critics that don't know, when these folks come down here and they get saved or they give something up, you have no idea. You have no idea their battle, and sometimes their shouts better than their, than their, their battle. Sometimes they got more glory than they did story, and you need to leave them alone. Makes me nervous. <laughs> You wait till you get to heaven. I'm going to chase you for a million years. <laughs> See, physically, Goliath will show up and he'll intimidate. Emotionally, Eliabs who tower over us, they, what they do is they, 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 get us, they get us focused on something that's not even, that's not what went down at all. If you don't let God heal you, you'll bleed on people that didn't cut you. And you'll miss the glory of God. And God's got you positionally in a place where he's trying to show other folks it's not in the bottle, it's not in the bag, it's not in the bed, it's not in the paycheck. And they're going to see the joy of the Lord on you. And it manifests itself in different ways, beloved. Not everybody manifests it the same way. But I promise you, wherever you are, if you let Eliab steal your joy, you'll miss a chance to share Jesus with somebody. Now, we've got to hurry. Not only positionally, I'm, I'm spiritually, is there oppression. Emotionally, there's oppression. There's, there's positional oppression. Now watch this and we're almost done. We're hastening to a close. Go to chapter 17, verse 38. Verse 38. So Saul, that's king, he heard about him. He called him into his tent and he clothed David with his armor. And he put a bronze helmet on his head and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. 
David fastened the sword to his armor and he tried to walk for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself. Listen to me. You are uniquely, wonderfully made in the image of the Father. There isn't another one like you. Somebody say, thank God. (laughs) There ain't another one like you. You're an original. Do you understand that? So old David, you've got to be intimidated. Here's this big old tall, good-looking king. And I know what we're all thinking. Well, I just sauntered in there, bless God, with all four foot eleven of myself. And told that king what for. Really? You know what's amazing to me, Christy and I, we've, we've had so many experiences. And we've been so blessed to have such an eclectic ministry. And this is going to disappoint some of you, but back a few years ago, I, I had to get some things legally in line for Aunt Dot. My, my, my mom, not biologically, but the woman who's been in my life my whole life, took us in when my mom was an unwed teenage mom. And I had to transfer her house to the state and get prepared for what we didn't want, which was her going to the nursing home. And Chris was with me that day. We drove into my hometown and she even remarked when we got in the parking lot, she said, you, this is really heavy. There's something wrong with you. And I said, baby, I'm just going to tell you, I'm, I dread this because the last time I was in this courthouse, it, it wasn't me. And some of those folks are probably still here and I'm ashamed of who I used to be. And so I made my way into the courthouse and I just looked down. I didn't even look up. I just scrambled to the clerk's office and I didn't even look up at the clerk. I, She'd been there since Noah got off the boat. She, I knew who she was. She knew who I was. I wasn't even going to tell her my name. I had a ball cap on. And I just slid the documents to be notarized and transferred. And I said, I just need to do this for Miss Dorothy Lee. And she said, now, wait a minute. What, what, what's your name? I said, my, my name is Jeff Lamorne. <laughs> she said, did you say Jeff Lamorne? I said, yes, ma'am. I looked up at her. I was waiting. I was waiting for her to say, you know, the last time I saw you, I was, I braced and I let, I let the spirit of Saul condemn me. And let me tell you what she said to me. She said to her, there was another lady that they, they're partners in crime. They've been doing this for a hundred years. She hollered across the clerk's room and said, come here. It's that preacher we watch every week online. Come here, Chef LaVar. It's that preacher we watch. <laughs> Could you just stamp this and let me go for the love of all that's holy? That's all I want. Listen to me. He chose for himself. He chose for himself. You understand that? You, when, when, when you're led of the Spirit, filled of the Spirit, washed in the blood on your way to heaven, you don't need, you don't need a Saul to tell you what to put on. In fact, I'm going I'm to blow your mind. This, this is revelation for me. I've preached this text several times, obviously, as a preacher. But only in the last few weeks prepping it for something else did I find this. I, it occurred to me because we've studied overseas so long that the tribe that David's from, which happens to be the tribe of Judah, they are proficient with two things. They're proficient with two things. They are like the original ninjas. Did you notice it said his staff? Son, they could put a whooping on you with a staff. They'd beat you seven ways from Sunday before you knew what would happen. But they were also incredibly proficient. Have you ever heard of the scepter of Judah? That's a Hebrewism. They could take a a spear and they could put it on any part of the anatomy and they are unbelievably accurate with it. But there's even a greater weapon, which would be my personal choice. The tribe of Judah was very proficient uh, proficient scripturally and historically with a bow and an arrow. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. You can judge me for this. But if I'm up against a big old ugly dude with six fingers and six toes on each part of him, I am going, I, listen, I, I'm a, I, I, I got an equalizer. It's called a nine millimeter. Let's shoot him in the kneecap. Let's shoot him in the kneecaps. And then when we get him down here, right? I mean, if I'm David, if I'm David, let me tell you what I'm going to do. Son, I am going out there with everything that I got. I'm going to put a bow and arrow. I'm going to put that sucker right in his left eye. When he goes down, I'm taking that staff. And in the name of Jesus, I'm going to bless him. Do you understand what I'm saying? And when I get him down there where I want him, I'm going to say, now, what do you want to do about it? Because if you come at me, I pack. I'm just telling you. I'm taking both kneecaps out. When you get down here where I live, we're going to talk about what you want to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? Why did he not do that? It's an interesting thing that in 
Leviticus chapter 17, about verse 52 or 54, the Bible says that if any blaspheme the name of the Lord, they are to be stoned. Oh, y'all got it. Y'all a lot quicker than that first crowd. Woo! Preacher, I'm up against something. What do I do? Just get in his audience because I'm telling you in his audience, there's mercies abounding. At his right hand is power. At his left hand is 10,000 upon 10,000 blessings. If I could just get in the audience of the king, I don't need a Goliath to impede me. I don't need, a, I don't need an Eliab to embarrass me. I don't need a Saul to encumber me. All I need to do is just get with the king. I just got to get with the one that's bought it all, paid it all, coming to bring it all. Well, what do you want to do when you get there? Oh, David, he's praying about it. And he said, you know, I could take the bow and arrow. I could get my. The, the, I could get the the spear of Judah. I, I could. I could just kneecap him real quick. But you know, the other day I was in my private praise and prayer time, and I got a word from the Word. And the Word said, if anybody ever blasphemes, and that's what he's doing, not once, not twice, three times, Goliath blasphemed the name of the Lord. And David said, "You blaspheme the name of the Lord. I'm not coming at you with spear yeah. or sword. Yeah. Why? Because you got a word from the Word." He said, I was in my private praise and prayer time. The Holy Ghost showed up in the book of Leviticus. You better know God's on if you got a word from Leviticus. <laughs> all it is is don't eat meat and circumcise. That's all it is. Amen. <laughs> Did you get blessed today? Yeah, circumcised and can't have a barbecue sandwich. <laughs> David, where did you get this kind of word? What made you, for the love of all that's holy, put down all of your military prowess and go pick up five small stones? He said, I was in the book of Leviticus, and it said, if anybody ever blasphemed the name of the Lord, stone them. Yeah. Talking about rocks, not the other. I know my audience. Get up here. <laughs> Get up here. Now watch what he does, and I'm done. Watch this. See, once, once, once I've dealt with my situation, boy, things look bad, preacher. Yeah, they do. They do. I, what's my location? Well, I, I am currently in an outpost as an ambassador. And the only reason I currently still am here is because I'm salt and light in a world that's lost its ever loving mind. And everywhere I'm going to go, I, I want to make people know that Jesus is coming back soon. And he's the joy of my strength. And he, he's the blessed hope. And they look at me like I'm still smoking crack. <laughs> what do you do when, when, Ga when Goliath and Eliab and Saul show up? Well, I I just stand on the blessed promise. I'm a child of the king. Yeah. How are you going to deal with Goliath? I'm going to go to the word and I'm going to get a word. And when I get a word from the word, I promise you this, that rock's not going to miss its spot. Yeah. You got one shot, David. I, no, I don't. No, I don't. I could thump that rock. Yeah. And God's taking that dude down. Yeah. Now watch what he does. I'm done. Watch this. The Bible says he went over and he picked up Goliath's sword and he cut off Goliath's head. Now, the Hebrew theologian tells me at the Temple Institute that that head weighed somewhere around 25 to 33 pounds. That's a big old pumpkin. <laughs> That's a big old head. He lopped that sucker off, picked it up and drug it 22 plus miles north to Jerusalem. That's an odd thing because they're not even set up necessarily. They, David's not going to reconcile the kingdom for, for at least another eight years. Hebron is, gonna, is a stronghold. Why did he take it to Jerusalem? What in the world are you dragging this big old pumpkin head for 22 miles? Here's what the Hebrews say. David got a word to deal with Goliath, but he had also been in the word. And in Galatians chapter, in Genesis chapter three, God stepped out and said to Satan, the scaly one, you, sir, are going to bruise the seed of the woman. There's one coming who's going to rectify. He's going to restore. He's going to set everything right. What you've stolen, he's going to restore. What you've taken, he's going to give. And it'll never be taken again. You're going to bruise his heel, but I want you to know he's going to crush your head. And the Hebrew theologian says, David buried that place, buried that head outside the gates of Jerusalem. And from that day forward, it was called the place of the skull. 
Not geographically because it looked like a skull like you're told in Israel today for tourism. It was, it was buried at the place of the skull because David did something in his worship that you and I got to do in these last moments of these last days. He looked beyond his own generation. He looked beyond his own situation. And he said this, I'm going to take care of something. I'm doing something I won't even get to live to see. I'm planting trees I'll never get to sit under. I'm planting that head at a place by revelation of God so that when Jesus Christ, they strip him naked, lay him down and nail him and hoist him. The Hebrews say they hoisted him right over the head of Goliath and the foot of Messiah crushed the head of Satan. And on that day, everything changed. And David stood in heaven and applauded in the cloud of witnesses and said, I wish I could tell y'all I knew all that. (laughs) I just did what God told me, even though I didn't understand what God was telling me. Listen to me and I'm done. There's a day coming. You and I don't fully understand it. He's got you bivouacked in a very special place. You're on the backside of Gad. You're on the backside of Benjamin. He's got you exactly where he wants you. There's a morning coming when you're going to stand before the very one who bought you and he's going to say, come here. And he's going to unfurl the history of your life and say, you had no clue. But in that moment, when you took authority, you didn't just change your situation. You changed multiple generations because you honored the word of the Lord.